Would it be crazy to enjoy more love in your life in under 60 minutes? Welcome to the Love with Intelligence radio show. I am your host, Lily Wolford, an international relationship and dating coach, and I have supported thousands of people like you to enjoy real, honest, and genuine love that lasts using behavioral psychology, body language, profiling, and so much more. Join us now as we dive into the deepest topics about love, dating, heartbreaks, and relationships. Hello, hello, hello. So I am diving into healing whilst dating and why I truly believe that it is a really important healing step to take within your journey, whether you've just gone through a breakup or you've come out of a narcissistic relationship or just a toxic relationship. This stage is so crucial. You will not believe the amount of people who I have seen who I want to say they've been stuck in the dating purgatory. You know, (laughs) we have people who have, um, you know, who share that they've not dated since their toxic relationship for 10 or 15 years or, you know, sometimes even longer, sometimes 20 years. And it's it's sad because when people have gone through relationships like that, when they've gone through toxic relationships and they've been so hurt and they've gone through so much pain that they're actually afraid of going out and dating again, they're in a state where they've given power to that old past relationship, that old past partner. And it's just so sad to see so many people getting stuck at that stage. Now, the thing is, I truly believe that everyone deserves to be able to enjoy, you know, enjoy love. You know, this is a part of the journey of enjoying life. You know, you build connections, you build friendships, you build partnerships, you have amazing sex, you build a family, you know, you create all these beautiful things along the way. Don't allow someone who's treated you badly get in the way of you enjoying that. So this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this episode today to really dive into the healing journey of actually getting out there again, going out, dating, healing some past wounds from that past relationship because that's important. So you can actually just get on with your life and enjoy it, you know, enjoy it, enjoy embracing new relationships. So (laughs) let's dive in. So when we have a look at toxic relationships, one of the most important things when you come out of toxic relationship is understanding what's happened and being able to understand your own needs, your own wants, your own desires, and getting back to that you know connection to yourself again. Because often with toxic relationships, with narcissists, with psychopaths, with sociopaths, one of the things that they do is they actually take away a lot of your autonomy. You know, we saw this on uh, whether you've decided to watch it or not, uh, Married at First Sight UK, um, where you see Brad saying weird words like, um, I let her, I gave her permission, you know, these kind of um, authoritative um, choices of words and phrases that he used in the relationship. And that's exactly how um, they, you know, those types of personalities groom people um, in, in their relationships. They choose these wordings. What tends to happen to the victim in a narcissistic or psychopathic or sociopathic or just toxic relationship? I'm just going to call it toxic from now on, just so it's easier. (laughs) Um, uh, You know, they take away their autonomy. Okay, so what I want you to understand is, number one, your emotions matter. Your desires matter. You know, what your goals are matter. You matter. And this is the thing, this is a part of the journey that no one talks about. When you are healing from a toxic relationship, a big part of that journey is learning to choose yourself again, okay? Choosing yourself as a priority, um, priority. choosing your happiness as a priority, choosing your goals as a priority. You are a priority, okay? That is like the first crucial level of, you know, being able to heal, okay? I'm giving you the crash course here. <laughs> you don't have to go around in circles and, you know, stay in therapy for years and years and years and years or stay single for years and years and years. Big part of this journey is learning that. So what I want you to do before you even step out to dating, you know, dating again, 
I want you to be able to understand what it is that you want. What is it that you're feeling? What is it that you're needing? And really get tuned into that because that's just the biggest part of the journey that no one talks about. And that's just the difference between being able to move on in a healthy way or being stuck in old patterns where that old partner and that old relationship has power and dominance over you, even though the relationship's ended. Okay. So that's my little like real talk. If you take anything away from the, uh, from this, uh, you know, episode so far, that is the bit that I really want you to take away. Okay. You are the priority. You need to choose you. You're important. That's it. Okay, just take that, write that down somewhere, (laughs) you know, put it on your bathroom mirror. That is like literally key to the success of being able to move on in a healthy, fantastic, quick way. Okay, so dating and healing. One of the things that tends to happen with toxic relationships is that your reality is corrupted by you know that toxic partner they will tell you that you are awful that you are terrible that you're revolting you're disgusting you're stupid you're this you're that the other so automatically you are already in that you know degraded kind of state where you're like oh gosh am I a bad person am I ugly am I thick am I this and that you know all these different things okay that's one of the first ways that they distort your reality the second part is what they tend to do is they try to make this scarcity feeling of they're the only person that you are able to have this healthy, loving relationship with. So they'll often turn around to you and say things like, um, well, you know, if, you, if you'll never meet anyone else like me, um, they'll say things like, um, you know, if you, if you go on to another relationship, they'll only be worse. So they'll try and make themselves, you know, seem like the perfect option for you or the only option for you. And then what they'll tend to do is they'll tend to bring in that bit of scarcity where you're worried about them cheating or maybe they have cheated or maybe they're talking about another person that they work with. You know, they'll bring in that scarcity. So automatically what tends to happen in that reality is that you're afraid of trusting. Okay, you you think, oh, gosh, all all men or all women think this way. And that's the way things are. That's the way the dating world is. Or that's the way relationships are. You know, we all have our problems. You know, they'll, they'll create this reality where it's like you have to accept what they're sharing, that you have to accept the reality that they've created. So the thing is about this is when you've been used to living in that reality, the only way to be able to fully let that reality go is being able to to actually step out, find the truth and step into a new reality, okay? So one of the things I really love about dating is that when you've gone from a toxic relationship and you start putting yourself out there, you start to realize, not everyone thinks this way. Not everyone thinks that you, you you know, you look awful, or you look revolting, or you look disgusting, or whatever it might be. There might be people going, wow, you're so clever, you're so gorgeous, you're so all, the, all these amazing compliments. It breaks the reality that you have been in for a long period of time, for the duration of that relationship. And that's so important because you need something to shock you out of that reality. You need to be able to see that contrast that's been created by that relationship. Because as soon as you do that, then it's almost like the veils, you know, the veil of what the narcissist has um, created has gone. You know, that power has been lifted. And you can start to see yourself through other people's eyes where you're like, oh, okay, actually, I am intelligent or actually, yeah, I am attractive. Or yes, actually, you know, I do bring a lot to a relationship or I have lived a fantastic life or whatever it might be. So that's really important. That's an important stage in a relationship. And there's only so much that you can. um, So it's an important stage of being able to heal from a narcissistic relationship. And that's something that you can only do when you really step into the reality of, you know, the dating world or, you know, being able to talk to people who, you know, you could potentially have a romantic relationship with. Because there's only going to be so much that a therapist can do and ask questions to be able to break down that veil or break down that old pattern of thinking. Okay, when you've got a multitude of people showing up and, and sharing at the same kind of reality of what they're seeing. So if you're being told by lots of different people that, wow, you're really intelligent or wow, you're such a great catch or wow, you're super, you know, you're super attractive or whatever that might be. 
it breaks down that veil faster. Okay, super, super important for to be able to heal. Then when you actually start connecting with different people, you can actually start to understand how toxic, um, uh, you know, your ex-partner's behaviors were. So you can start to notice, like, um, uh, you know, the different things that they might have said or the different things that they might have done. The other thing that you might notice is the way that you act. OK, because what tends to happen in those narcissistic relationships or toxic relationships is that you get conditioned. So if you think about, um, let's think of the best way to put it. If you have got used to being punished for doing a certain behavior, you know, if that's a repetitive thing that's happened, you will be shut down. You know, you will not want to go ahead and repeat that behavior if you're being punished for it. So it might be something on the lines of certain conversations that you had to avoid in that relationship. It might have been, um, you know, if you expressed how you felt and they felt, um, um, I can't think of the words now. <laughs> if they felt um, resentful for how you feel or felt like um, you were blaming them or they felt bad or they felt, you know, really um... cool. Where are my words going at the moment? <laughs> Where they feel defensive. That's the word that I'm looking for. If they felt defensive over the, you know, if you shared how you felt or let's say that if you went and saw friends and they made big issues or problems when you went out to go and see your friends, slowly but surely if they kept that consistency of of um showing their disapproval or being defensive or showing sort of any sort of form of negative reaction you're not going to show up in that way or you're not going to share your feelings anymore you're not going to go out with your friends anymore so your behaviors get curved so um that's where i get curved so when you go into a new relationship or you start dating or you start talking about the past or whatever it might be you start to realize that your behaviors were being curbed by their toxic behaviors or viewpoints. So this can be a really, really good stage and quite a, a jarring stage as well, because you can start to understand how bad that relationship actually was. You know, if you suddenly realize that, oh, you know, in a, in a new relationship, you can talk about your feelings or you can talk about your needs and suddenly your you know, new partner's going, oh, yeah, that's that's more than valid. Or, yes, good idea. Let's do that. Versus, well, you shouldn't be feeling that way. That's ridiculous. You should, you know, or, um, you know, something on those sides where you're being shut down or told off or punished for it. So this is this is the thing about when you go into a new relationship where you start putting yourself out there dating, you can see the contrast. OK, that's so important. So, so important, because when you start to see that contrast, you will never go back to that toxic relationship or anything like that again. In fact, you will be completely repulsed by it. You'll be hypersensitive to it. Um, uh, you know, you'll notice the difference as well within your body, because when you've been in a toxic relationship, your body is in that place of fright or flight. OK, it's ready to go. Oh, gosh, I need to fight. You know, I need to be in a firefighting mode. There's going to be a problem soon. There's going to be an issue. You're waiting for the next bad thing. OK, and if you've gone through a toxic relationship, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. When you start transitioning to dating and going into a healthy relationship, the hypervigilance comes down. OK, you can suddenly realize that when, uh, you know, your new partner hugs you or kisses you or anything like that, you can feel your body going, oh, I can relax versus being in a state of, oh, OK, what's going to happen next? I'm suddenly going to find a text message from another woman or I'm going to do this. or I'm going to do that. You know, you're not in that hypervigilant, scary ass mode anymore. You're not treading on eggshells, worried about what they're going to flip out about next. It's a very different um way of being so what tends to happen when you go from that toxic relationship to something that's healthy you'll notice that your base level of um let's try and think of the best way to put it your base level of your hyper vigilance or your um the base level of your fight or flight basically let's just try and think I think that's a better way of putting it bear with me i'm still finding my words 
<laughs> so basically, right, I've got it. So your baseline of how you normally feel in a narcissistic relationship is basically treading on eggshells. Okay, it's there. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm waiting for the next bad thing to happen. You're, you're hyper vigilant. You're in that thing of like, oh, you know, you you can feel that tense, tenseness. When you're in a healthy relationship, that baseline's down here. You know, it, it, you're not really, you know, you're relaxed. You're, you feel at home. You feel comforted. You feel safe. You're not having to be up here anymore. It's like the equivalent of, um, I know it's going to sound like a, I'm, I'm going to give like a very um, excessive example here, but it's the difference between living in a bloody war zone and living in a place that's completely peaceful. Okay. You're going to have very different relaxed baselines in each of those situations. And a narcissistic relationship is very, very similar because you're waiting for that next psychological and emotional bomb to go off versus knowing that you're completely safe, that you can sleep, that you're, you know, nothing's going to happen. You're in this peaceful, safe environment where everything's okay. So if you think about it, you know, you, if you've been used to being in that hypervigilant treading on eggshells mode and you suddenly transition to an environment that's safe, into a relationship that's loving, that's comforting and all those different things, you are going to see the difference within yourself. You're going to feel completely more at peace. You're going to feel relaxed and you're going to notice the how crazy it is, how how um, hypervigilant you felt in that previous relationship. You're going to be able to see the distance Sorry, the difference. <laughs> Don't know what's going on with my language at the moment. You're going to be able to see the difference. The thing is, you can only really see that when you've got a different normality to be able to prepare um, to compare that to. If you've been in a hypervigilant, treading on eggshell state, and that's been your no normality for a year, two years, three years, 10 years, 20 years, you know, you're not going to realize that that's a bad state and that's a stressful state to be in on your body unless you transition to something that's very very different that's healthy that's loving that's safe and you're going to be able to see the difference then and you're going to avoid being in anything like that you know that horrible hypervigilant state you're going to avoid that like the freaking plague <laughs> you're going to suddenly realize the partners and the people that bring that horrible hypervigilant tread and eggshells energy and you're going to make sure that you're only surrounding yourself with people who bring that level of peace, comfort and safety. OK, so <laughs> that's a very long winded way of putting it. But it's true. The other thing is when you go into dating and you're meeting new people and you're going through um, you know, new relationships and all these different things, you're going to have more things to process. OK, you're going to have triggers. You're going to go through certain things and see things very differently. You know, from your past relationship, there's going to be a lot that's going to come up. The beauty of this is that because you've had that trigger from being able to go dating and going into new relationships, because you've had that trigger, you're going to be able to heal it. If you are stuck into isolating yourself and avoiding that, you know, going out, dating, meeting new people and all those different things, you're not going to be triggered. You're going to be stuck and you're going to have, um, uh, you know, that baggage in the background that you're never going to be able to resolve. Because the only way you resolve something is if something is brought to your awareness. When you have had something that's brought to your awareness, you then have a conscious choice to make on what you go ahead and do with that. And again, this is the thing I love about dating. It brings all this to the surface. The thing is, I truly believe that people are the answer to healing. Connections are the answer to healing. You know, yes, okay, they bring problems too, but <laughs> the majority of the time, you know, people are able to help you to understand yourself more deeply so you can heal. So it's being able to see the opportunities in that. Even if you go out dating and you have a really bad date, you're suddenly going to learn, I don't want this or I don't like this in a partner or this is really important to me in a relationship. You're going to have a deeper understanding of yourself because you've put yourself out there and put yourself in those situations to see the different contrasts. 
Because the other thing is, when you've also come out of a toxic relationship, you are in a place where you are relearning yourself. I almost call um, the victim of a of a toxic relationship the external hard drive. You know, usually because you've had to be so plugged into your ex-partner where you've had to understand their emotions as well as yours. You've had to be on tender hooks to understand where they're at so you know what to say, what not to say, how to act and all those different things. And also you've probably had some of your beliefs and values slightly warped by them because they wanted to change you slightly to make sure that you can fit in with them. So you're in this state of then uh, asking yourself, who am I? What do I enjoy? What life do I want to live? And the only way that you can really understand that is, yes, having that time to yourself, but also being able to speak to other people, learn about other people, connect with other people, because they're going to share different belief systems, different values, different dreams, different priorities that are going to help you to understand a little bit more about you and what's important to you in a relationship. So it's it's a journey. It's a journey and this is something that I truly believe is really helpful to be able to support you to heal and transition to something that's healthy. The other thing is as well, with with these types of relationships, you want to be able, um, you know, when you come out of a toxic relationship, you want to be able to also learn how to say the words no, (laughs) okay? And when you're out dating, When you're out being able to meet new people, you can learn that really quickly. Because when you come out of a toxic relationship, all of a sudden you've got very, you you know, you're in this hypervigilant state. You understand what you really don't want and what you're not going to um, tolerate anymore. So it's exercising that muscle when you go, okay, there's that person there. They've got, you know, X, Y, Z deal breakers for you. It's easy for you to go, no, thank you. I've gone, I've gone through enough of that. Well, that person's got no empathy yet. Yeah, no, nope, I'm good. Thank you. I don't want someone who's self-centered with no empathy. So <laughs> you're able to learn to say no, and it can build your confidence up because the big part of confidence and self-worth and all those different things I'm going I'm to explain this slightly differently because I think when I explain things like this, people really understand what self-confidence is and what self-worth is. And it's your ability to trust yourself to be able to meet your own standards, okay? And meet your own needs. So trust is being able to say no to things that are not right for you. I want you to think about a time in your life where you knew that you should have said no in that moment and you didn't. What did that feel like in your body? And that's usually the sign of that trust breaking down. And when you break down that trust, you can bring in anxiety, you can bring feeling low, you can bring in depression, all these different things because you haven't been prioritizing yourself. Okay, you've not said yes to you. You've not been able to protect yourself. You've not been able to say yes to yourself and your needs. So that's stuff that starts to bring you down. So this is why it's really important to be able to have those boundaries, to be able to focus on your needs, to focus on your emotions, to focus on your goals and to build yourself up. Because the thing is, when you start to meet people who have high levels of emotional intelligence, high levels of empathy, they're going to want what's best for you. So I'm actually chatting to a client the other day and, um, you know, she had some issues around being able to place boundaries and things like that. You know, we've, we've all, we've all been there. One of the things I said to her was I said to her, right, I want you to know how painful it is to watch someone who you really love, not prioritize themselves. And I think at that moment, she she knew that her um, one of her siblings was going through a really awful time and they hadn't been prioritized themselves and they'd been staying in bed all day. And, you know, they were in a real depressive state. They weren't, you know, they weren't doing anything to build themselves back up. And I said to her, I said, how awful was is it to see someone in that state? Okay, you know, someone that you love that's not prioritizing themselves. Would you turn around to that person and say, right, you need to prioritize me now, right? 
bedridden, you know, it was a sister who was um, going through a bad time. You know, I said to her, would you turn around to your sister and say, hang on, you're in bed. You need to focus on me and my needs and listen to all my problems. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> and this is the thing you want, you know, when you love someone, when you, whether it's family, whether it's romantic partner, you want them to have what's best for them. OK, and this is what you need to relearn for you right now. You need to relearn that it's a good thing to prioritize you. Those that love you will feel awful if you are not prioritizing you. It will hurt them if you're not prioritizing you. OK, really, really, it's, I, I can't stress enough how important that is. And that's really the, dif the difference between a healthy relationship and, and one that's not. When you think about a healthy relationship, you know, both partners in that relationship are responsible for themselves, okay? They're responsible for themselves first. They prioritize their needs. They prioritize their happiness. They prioritize their goals. Yes, they prioritize the relationship as well, but they prioritize themselves first. Because if you've got a partner that's not prioritized themselves, that brings the relationship down. You know, if you've got someone who's, you know, not looking after themselves, they're not washing their clothes, they're, you know, they're staying in bed all day. What effect does that have on the relationship when they're not prioritizing themselves? It brings it down. It's simple as that. So it's really important to be able to prioritize yourself and bring yourself up to understand your own needs, to understand your own emotions, understand all those different things. And the thing is, the right relationship will bring that out. The right person for you will actually go, is that okay? Is that what you want? How do you feel about that? They will do everything to make sure that you feel comfortable and feel good emotionally and they will be checking in with you. That's the way a healthy relationship goes. So this is the thing that you'd be looking out for when you're dating, when you're getting out there. And, um, and the beautiful thing is when you've got a partner that does this on a consistent basis, that's something that brings out the trust in relationships because what tends to happen in toxic relationships is that you get taught that you cannot trust anyone, including yourself, because you stop choosing yourself, you stop prioritizing yourself, so that breaks down that trust in yourself, and you end up loving someone who you know deep down you could never trust. So what tends to happen is when you have a perception about yourself, um, uh, whether it's positive or negative, you actually project that um, that thought and that process onto other people. So if you go, oh, I can't trust myself, you say, I can't trust everyone. If you say, I don't like myself, you say, I don't like anyone. If you say, um, you know, I'm such a happy person, oh, there's so many happy people out there. You know, you will project anything that you feel about yourself. This is one of the reasons why I really love hearing about when people talk about other people in general, <laughs> because I get a really good idea and understanding of how that person actually feels about themselves. So, but you, you can kind of get the picture. So when we have a look at the dating journey for people as well, especially if you've gone through a toxic relationship, it's that thing of being able to prioritize yourself. I don't know how many times I've said that during this, but I hope you really get the message because that's the first step. Um, uh, because what tends to happen as well is the first stage of a new relationship. You, If you think about a narcissistic relationship in particular, I know we're going to talk of generalized about toxic relationships, but just talking about a narcissistic relationship and just for this example, it's intense. There's lots of things going on. There's, um, you know, all the love bombing. There's so much like intensity of building that connection um, uh, in a addictive way. When you have a look at trauma bond, the way it's built is love bombing, love bombing, love bombing, love bombing, bam. You know, I'm suddenly going to pull you down and say, you know, I'm going to prioritize other things about you. I'm gonna, if I'm going to use um, the married at first sight example of Brad, he starts saying words like, you know, I'm going to allow you, I'll give you permission. He also turns around and says things like, well, nothing comes above the universe. That's something that he actually shares with Shona, um, uh, you know, saying that she doesn't come, she doesn't come first, the universe does. And that's another thing that they tend to do. They start to bring that person down. So they do all the love bombing and then they basically say, well, you're not a priority to me. You, you know, yes, I've said I love you and all the rest of it, but actually you're not a priority to me. So they build you up to pull you back down. 
in a healthy relationship, the way it starts is actually quite slow. So when you've come out of a toxic relationship and you're going into something that's healthy, that can be a little bit jarring because you're relearning to focus on yourself versus do they like me? Are they okay? Are they happy? Do they see where do they see this relationship going versus do I like this person? Do I feel good about this person? Does this person actually fit in with what I want and what I need in the, in a partner and in the future? So you start to actually, um, you know, it's a great time to actually start to realize that you need to pull that focus back on yourself and your needs. And it's being able to spot the codependence patterns that you had in the previous relationships and how to stop them in their tracks. So you start breaking down those codependency patterns. So anytime that you find yourself focusing on the other person going, oh, do they like me? Are they okay? Are they happy? And all these different things. You need to start asking yourself, well, am I happy? Do I like this person? And bring that focus back to you. That's super, 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 super important. The other thing as well, I'm going to talk a little bit about, okay, is trauma. What most people don't understand about narcissistic relationships or psychopathic relationships or even sociopathic relationships is usually they cause a form of um, complex PTSD. Okay, you see this a lot. So this is where you get the hypervigilant behavior. So hypervigilance can be seen in, in a variety of different ways. Um, uh, usually in highly empathic people, okay, I'm going to say this, some people are not going to get it, some people are going to be like, oh my gosh, me too, okay, I don't know which one you are, but here we go. One of the things that I found when I was in a toxic relationship was I would know exactly how my ex would feel anytime they walked into a room. I would literally feel their emotions, and and the weird thing is, I actually went through a phase of not knowing what was mine and what was his when it came to um, my emotions. So he'd walk in the room and all of a sudden I'd be like, oh, I feel I feel anxious. Why do I feel anxious? I've got nothing to feel anxious about. That would be literally my internal dialogue. And I'd actually ask him, do you feel anxious? Are you anxious about something? And he would check. He would actually say, yes, okay. And as soon as he said yes, it's like, oh, okay, it's his. So I would feel his emotions to that kind of degree it actually got to a point where I could actually feel, um, I used to feel his headaches. So he'd walk in the room and I'd be like, oh my gosh, I can just feel this pressure in my head right here. And he's like, oh yeah, I've got a headache. Ah, oh, cool. You know, thanks for that. Ended, ended up feeling not just his um, emotions, but his physical pain as well. So that's actually a form of hypervigilance, <laughs> which, is, which is great. You know, if, if, you, if you've experienced that too, let me know, because I know some people do, some people don't. But if you're highly in tune with your emotions and highly empathic, yeah, chances are you've gone through that too. So uh, what you need to do, I need to think where I was even going with this. <laughs> so what you need to find out is actually, you know, how important your emotions are, what you're feeling and being able to tune into that. Um, that was it, complex PTSD. That's what I was talking about. Sorry, bear with me. So you have hypervigilance when it comes to um, PTSD, that's what hypervigilance can look like. The other thing is as, as well, because your body has been used to being in fight or flight mode, you're going to find that things, you're going to find certain things to be quite triggering. And because your levels, so I want you to think about um, the fight or flight system as a kabika, like a mug or something like that. And I want you to think about in a narcissistic relationship, that beaker is almost full of water, okay? And when you get triggered, that water will overflow. So if you've got high levels, if that beaker is really full from all the crazy stuff of trying to you know, tread on eggshells and all those different things, you're gonna be triggered very, very quickly. It won't take a lot, okay? So what tends to happen is when you've transitioned to something as healthy or you go into the dating world, it doesn't take a lot for things to trigger you. So you might find that something really simple will trigger you. And it, I, you know, I'll share some of mine so you've got a few different ideas of what they might be and how to overcome them. So <laughs> one of mine, um, when I came out of my toxic relationship, was seeing a phone screen. 
So uh, in the new relationship, when I was seeing their phone screen, it was too much. I would have to look away. And I didn't realize that that was a triggered response. I mean, I'd feel my heart rate raise. I'd feel uncomfortable. Um, uh, I'd want to walk out the room or, you know, at least turn my head away from their phone. So that would be something that was very, very simple that was enough to actually trigger my fight or flight. Maybe not in a major significant way, but enough for my body to have a, um, have a big response where my heart rate would change, where my breathing would change. And it was enough to be able to trigger me. So what you would do in those moments is actually ground, okay? Really, really important to be able to ground. So if you don't know how to ground or how to look after your nervous system, I'll probably do, uh, do you know what? I'm actually going to do an episode. I'll do a full episode on being able to ground after toxic relationships because looking after your nervous system after those relationships and being able to regulate yourself is super, super important. But to give you a few ideas of what you can do, um, just for now, before that episode releases, <laughs> now I've had that idea, um, uh, routine, have a routine, okay, whether it's a little morning routine and a little evening routine, even if you're really rebellious to routines like I am, um, uh, you know, do that for yourself, even if it's just for five, 10 minutes a day, I mean, for me, I go out, I walk my dogs in the morning, that's a part of my routine, I have a, you know, a cup of coffee afterwards, Again, that's part of my routine. So you're building in that stability within your life um, with that routine. And that helps with the nervous system, re-regulating it, getting it calmer, allowing it to feel more stable. The other thing that you can do, so if you get, find yourself being triggered, um, a very simple one is being able to touch something around you. So I've got a cushion here. <laughs> being able to touch something, being able to focus on something visually. So if let's say I was just focusing on this cushion right now I'll be looking at the cushion I'd be feeling it and I'd be looking at, at the material and then I would also be focusing on my breathing so breathing in now and then I'll be listening for sounds and what we can do with sounds is you can listen for the different layering so you can listen to example um for example you can listen to my voice you can listen to my breath you can listen to your own breath you can listen to um, the things that are going on around you. you might notice that you can hear your clothes rubbing when you're moving. You know, you can start to notice those things. And what it's doing is it's just bringing you back to the present moment. Now, one of the things that's really important about bringing yourself to the present moment is it's reminding you're here. You're not in that past. You're not the old version of you that's gone through all that crazy stuff. You're here. You're right now. You're safe. OK, so and I will do I will do a full episode on that because I think actually that's something that's really important to be able to talk about. But for now, you know, having a look at the dating journey, you can start to see how healing it actually is when we start to see all the different triggers and all the different processes and all the different contrasts of something that's toxic to something that's healthy and being able to have a look at distorting that old reality that they have created to being able to see what's true. OK, and then also being able to prioritize you. So this is something that can happen in, you know, <laughs> basically accelerate your healing journey through being able to do this. So this is something that I genuinely just love to be able to support people to go through because. Yes, it's an up and down journey. Yes, it can be very triggering. Yes, it can be very jarring. But at the same time, when you're going through those different processes. So whether it's being able to, you know, get out there and date um, and start meeting people and, you know, you might have got a bit triggered going out or you might have had a bit of anxiety going on your first date. It's great because those little pangs and those little triggers and those little things that are coming up, it's basically saying that your body is actually ready to heal. Your mind is actually ready to heal. You're, you are ready to start focusing on you and pushing yourself forward. Um, in the best possible way where you can enjoy what you want to enjoy versus being stuck in the holding pattern of holding on to all that old trauma and all that old baggage from that relationship. So my personal advice is don't stay stuck. Don't stay, don't hold back from loving someone because you've been treated by someone who doesn't know what to do with love. Because that's the thing of narcissists and toxic partners. They've got no idea on how to love or how to be loved. And that's a sad thing. 
You know, when we have a look at the empathy part of the brain of a narcissist, that is underdeveloped. That's been scientifically proven. That will never change. Okay. That person has to live with that forever. Okay. They're never going to understand what real love is. They're never going to be able to love someone the way that empaths and we can. You know, they're never going to be able to receive love the same way we can. So that's their burden to bear. Good for them. Doesn't mean that you need to stop loving and start, you know, stop enjoying what it's like to actually be in something that's healthy. Okay. So I'm just going to let you drill that home. This is your time to prioritize you. And the truth is, we all need support to be able to get there. We all need, you know, doesn't because you've gone through a toxic relationship and you've gone through something that's absolutely bloody awful and it might have, you know, wobbled your trust and all the rest of it doesn't mean you shouldn't trust people to help you on your journey. There are good people out there who want the best for you. And that's one of the reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing now. You know, it's because not everyone understands this journey. Not everyone understands what a narcissist is like and what and how they think and the way they operate and, you know, the level of vindictiveness that they can actually bring to a relationship. I mean, I was just chatting to another one of my clients who's, you know, going through the dating journey. And she said to me, um, oh, Lily, what do you think this text means? And she's uh, met a guy. He seems absolutely fantastic. Um, uh, he seems really into her. And he sent her a message that actually indicates that he is actually only seeing her. But because she'd gone through a narcissistic relationship, she read the message as a threat. She went, oh, what does this mean? You know, is this something that's bad? Because in a narcissistic, you know, a narcissistic relationship, it would have meant something bad. So I'll share, you, I'll share with you, um, uh, you know, a version of what that message was. So you will understand if you've gone through a narcissistic relationship, you'll know exactly what I mean. So this guy had messaged her saying um, something on the lines of, oh, I just had just been invited out by um, uh, another lady um you know a networking event I've just had to turn her down I'm no player so you know it was something on those lines you know I'm not it's not verbatim verbatim but something on those lines in the world of dating a narcissist that would have meant you know he'd probably been got a number probably slept with her was just kind of giving you little tiny bits to keep you on your toes it would have been something vindictive nasty and horrible in a healthy relationship it was a guy turned around and said oh by the way I'm being open and transparent I have been asked out. I did turn them down. And yeah, I'm not interested in basically seeing other people. You know, you're just the one I'm seeing at the moment. And I just want to be open and transparent with you. You can see the difference in the two different mindsets, but it can be really difficult to be able to see that when you've gone through a narcissistic relationship. So this is why I do what I do. This is why I support people on their journey. So they're able to see the contrast and the difference of being able to say, okay, this is something that's unhealthy. This is something that's healthy. And being able to help them navigate their own nervous systems as they're going through the transition of letting go of that narcissistic relationship, healing and entering something that's healthy because it is a journey. And it's not for the faint hearted. <laughs> It's really not, but it's bloody rewarding when you get there. Um, so that's really important. You know, that's really, really important to have that that grounded sounding board. Because the truth is, if you think about um, you know, that that analogy of the beaker, you know, being filled with water, it doesn't take a lot for that to overflow. And when that overflows, how easy is it to spiral? and spiral downwards and go into a very bad, bad thought pattern or freak out or whatever it might be. You don't want to be in that place when someone healthy comes along. So that's one of the, the roles that I have when I'm supporting people. It's supporting them to heal. It's supporting them to prioritize themselves, but it's also supporting them through the little wobbles that can come, come along during you know the early stages of a new relationship and dating. The other thing as well, uh, and I will do an episode on this, is understanding why you ended up in that relationship, understanding why you might have attracted a toxic partner, because that's something that needs breaking down as well, okay? But usually, it's not just because, you know, you're an empath and you're a good kind of person, all the rest of it. I've heard, ugh, I've heard all that. <laughs> the truth is, it's not. It's to do with the level of conditioning that you've had as a child growing up. 
Okay, it's to do with the way that you see yourself and the way that you prioritize yourself. But I will do a deeper episode on that because I think it's important and I think more people need to understand what that actually is. So it's making sure that you've broken that pattern enough to avoid those types of relationships. So I mean, <laughs> I'll give you I'll give you an example. So when I went, um, when I broke up with the toxic partner that I was with, I went started dating, I started meeting different people. And one of the people I was chatting to, I was like, Oh, actually, I've got this, you know, interesting, um, you know, if I felt like an interesting connection there thought it was like a very interesting you know person I was chatting to we had we were both entrepreneurs we were very you know we, we were um you know had very similar things going on very similar um you know interests and all those different things but I just had this gut feeling there was something just not quite right so I decided to actually have and this is, and people laugh at me when I say this we had a zoom date we kind of decided to say right we're going to meet on zoom we're going to have a little chat and just see how things are. And as soon as I met him, I knew that he was a sociopath because of my training, because of things that I'd learned. Um, and I was able to spot that and go, right, okay, right, let's, let's have a look at this. How has this happened? What are the different things that happened there? What are the different things that I can see that confirms that this person's definitely either a sociopath or narcissist? Um, uh, and how do I disengage safely? Because, yeah, that there's... I need to do another episode on that, just that conversation alone, because that was very interesting. <laughs> but basically, um, you know, it helped me to realize um, how to break that pattern in that moment. OK, what needed to be broken? Because otherwise that could have been me going into another toxic relationship. On that occasion, thank goodness that wasn't the case and I was able to spot it. But again, this is stuff that I do for my clients. I'm able to turn around to them and say, right, this person, healthy person to be with, this person, no, they're not a healthy person. And here's the details why. And I love being able to say that to people. Here's why. Because this means that when I share that with them, they can understand. They can see the logic and the facts. It's not me just going from my gut feeling. It's not from just me telling them, oh, by the way, just trust your intuition. It's going, right, yes, your intuition is really important. And I'm going to tell you why your intu intuition is absolutely right or why your intuition actually might this isn't quite right because you've gone through this trauma, you've gone through this, and actually that's a triggered response versus something that your intuition is actually telling you um uh, is correct okay so you're able then to navigate things from a very different way um uh, where you start building that trust within yourself you know prioritizing yourself understanding yourself healing yourself so you can be the best fullest version of you that's enjoying a healthy loving relationship where you can deeply connect and really enjoy the love that you deserve so i've covered a ton here and I can hear my voice starting to go <laughs> so I think that's my time to be able to say that's a wrap <laughs> but if this has been useful you know please feel free to let me know I love hearing feedback I love hearing from you guys I love hearing about your journeys so please you know send me some feedback put me some you know comments down drop me an email even if you want to or even jump on our website book a call with me it'd be great to chat with you because at the end of the day you know I truly believe everyone deserves to have the most amazing relationship possible everyone deserves to enjoy what love actually feels like but not everyone knows how to experience that and I'd love to be able to support you to be able to experience that so if that's something you want to do and you fancy having a chat jump over to lovewithintelligence.com um, book a free insights call you can talk to me for 15 minutes absolutely free no sales no all that you know sales crap you literally get to talk to me about what you need to talk to me about and we will solve whatever you need to solve within those 15 minutes yeah I'm that good and I'm that bloody confident with it <laughs> so <laughs> bring me your issues bring me your problems and we can go through that together um, and then the other thing is you know if there's anything you think oh Lily you need to do an episode on this or can we talk about that drop it in the comments. I would love to hear your insights or things that have happened or your experiences, because I want to make sure that I am really talking about the things that really matter to you. I literally want to be able to put so much stuff out there for you to be able to learn, 
understand and then go on to enjoy loving connected healthy relationships don't let the narcs win (laughs) right on that note i'm gonna love you and leave you thank you so much for watching and i'll speak to you all soon bye for now thank you for joining us on the love with intelligence radio show I'm so grateful that you joined us today and I'm also so grateful that you are dedicating your time to improve your love life. So as you are already on this journey, would it be crazy for you to jump over to our website lovewithintelligence.com and check out our many resources that's going to support you to enjoy your dream love life now. So that's love with intelligence.com and I shall see you next time. Bye for now.